So you kind of implied a, perhaps a hopeful message, but let me ask it in the form of a question. Do you think we'll always have war? I think it goes to the force question too. So for example, um, what do you do? I mean, we're, we're, let's, let's play with nation states now, although I don't know that nation states uh, are something we should think of as a permanent construct well, forever. Um, but how is one nation state supposed to prevent another nation state from acting in ways that it would see as either detrimental to the global community or detrimental to the interest of their own nation state? Um, you know, and I, I think I think we've had this question of uh, going back to ancient times, but certainly in the 20th century, this has come up quite a bit. I mean, the whole Second World War argument sometimes revolves around the idea of what the proper counterforce should be. Uh, can you create an entity, a League of Nations, a United Nations, uh, a one world entity maybe even, that, that alleviates the need for counterforce involving mass violence and armies and navies and those things? Uh, I think that's an open discussion we're still having. It's good to think through that. Because um, having a, like a United Nations, there's usually a centralized control. So there's humans at the top. There's committees and uh, usually like leaders emerge as singular figures that then can become corrupted by power. And it's just a really important, it feels like a really important thought experiment and something to really rigorously think through. How can you construct systems of government that uh, are stable enough to push us towards less and less war and less and less unstable and another tough word, which is unfair of application of force. You know, it's, that's really at the core of the question that we're trying to figure out as humans. As our weapons get better and better and better at destroying ourselves, it feels like it's important to think about how we minimize the over application or unfair application of force. There's other elements that come into play too. You and I are discussing this at the very high intellectual level of things, but there's also a tail wagging the dog element to this. So think of a society of warriors, uh, a tribal society from a long time ago. Um, how much do the fact that you have warriors in your society and that their reason for existing, what they take pride in, what they train for, um, what their status in their own civilization, how much does that itself drive the responses of that society, right? Um, uh, how much do you need war to legitimize warriors? Um, you know, that's the old argument that you get to, and we've had this in the 20th century too, that that the creation of arms and armies creates a an incentive to use them, right? And and that they themselves can drive that incentive as, as a justification for their reasons for existence, you know? Um, that's where we start to talk about the interactivity of all these different elements of society upon one another. So when we talk about you know governments and war, well, you need to take into account the various things those governments have put into place in terms of systems and armies and things like that to, to protect themselves, right? For reasons we can all understand, but they exert a force on your, your range of choices, don't they? It's true. You're making me realize that uh, in my upbringing, and I think upbringing of many, warriors are heroes. You know, to me, I don't know where that feeling comes from, but to sort of uh, die fighting <laughs> is, uh, is an honorable way to die. It feels like that. I've always had a problem with this because as a person interested in military history, I, right. the distinction is important. Um, and I try to make it at different levels. So at base level, the, the people who are out there on the front lines doing the fighting, uh, to me, those people can be compared with police officers and firemen and people that fire persons. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, people that are, are um, involved in an ethical uh, attempt to perform a task, which ultimately uh, one can see in many situations as being a saving sort of task, right? Or, or, or if nothing else, a self-sacrifice for what they see as the greater good. Now, I draw a distinction between the individuals and the entity that they're a part of, a military, and I certainly draw a distinction between the military and then the entire, for lack of a better word, military-industrial complex that that service is a part of. Uh, I feel a lot less um, moral attachment 
to uh, to those upper echelons than I do the people on the ground. The people on the ground could be any of us and have been in a lot of, you know, we have a very professional uh, sort of military now where it's a very, uh, a subset of the population. But in other periods of time, we've had conscription and drafts and, and it hasn't been a subset of the population. It's been the population, right? And so it is the society oftentimes going to war. And I make a distinction between those warriors and the entities either in the system that they're part of the military or the people that control the military at the highest political levels. I feel um, a lot less moral attachment to them. And I, and I have a much harsher about how I feel about them. I do not consider um, the military itself to be heroic. And I do not consider the military industrial complex to be heroic. I do think that is a tail wagging the dog situation. I do think that draws us into looking at um, military endeavors as a solution to the problem much more quickly than we otherwise might. And to be honest, to tie it all together, I actually look at the at the victims of this as the soldiers we were talking about. I mean, if you if you set a fire to send firemen into to fight, mm -hmm. um, then I feel bad for the firemen. I feel like you've abused the trust that you give those people, right? So when when people talk about war, I always think that the people that we have to make sure that a war is really necessary uh, in order to protect are the people that you're going to send over there to fight that. The, the greatest victims in our society of war are often the warriors. So I, I, in my mind, um, you know, when we see these people coming home from places like Iraq, a place where I would have made the argument and did at the time that we didn't belong. To me, those people are victims. And I know they don't like to think about themselves that way because it runs totally counter to the to the ethos. But if you're sending people to protect this country's shores, those are heroes. If you're sending people to go do something that they otherwise probably don't need to do, but they're there for political reasons or anything else you want to put in that's not defense related, well, then you've made victims of our heroes. And so I, I, I feel like we do a lot of talk about our troops and our soldiers and stuff, but we don't treat them as valuable yeah. as we as 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 the rhetoric makes them sound. Otherwise, we would be more um we would be much more careful about where we put them. If you're going to send my son, and I don't have a son, I have daughters, but if you're going to send my son into harm's way, I'm going to demand that you really need to be sending him into harm's way, and I'm going to be angry at you if you put him into harm's way if he doesn't if, if it doesn't warrant it. And so I have much more suspicion about the system that sends these people into these situations where they're required to be heroic than I do the people on the ground that I look at as um, either uh, the people that are defending us, uh, you know, in, in situations like this, you know, the Second World War, for example, or or the people that um, turn out to be the individual victims of a system where they're just a cog in a machine and the machine doesn't really care as much about them as as the the rhetoric and the propaganda uh, would insinuate. Yeah, and uh, as my own family history, it would be nice if we could talk about, there's a gray area in, in the places that you're talking about. In there's a gray area in everything. In everything. But when that gray area is part of your own blood, as it is for me, it's it's worth shining a light on somehow. Sure, give me an example of what you mean. So you did a, a program of four episodes of Ghosts of the Ostfront. Yeah. So I was born in uh, the Soviet Union. I was raised in Moscow. My dad was born and raised in Kiev. My grandmother, who just recently passed away, was um, uh, raised in Ukraine. She- a city. It's a small city on the border between Russia and Ukraine. I have a grandfather born in Kiev. In Kiev. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about the timing of everything, as you might be able to connect, is she survived. She's the most badass woman of, of, uh, I've ever encountered in my life. And most of the warrior spirit I carry is probably from her. Uh, she survived Polymer, the Ukrainian starvation of the 30s. She was a beautiful teenage girl during the Nazi occupation of so she survived all of that. And of course, family that everybody, you know, and so many people died to that whole process. So 